Okay, I don't know how much of this we're going into. I just kind of threw things as they came up. <laughs> I don't even know what we're going to decide. Uh, any, anything in there particularly sticking out to anyone? Uh. First off, you're, you're a Zygos, right? Uh, not anymore. <laughs> What, did I talk you out of it last time? <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's not that. It's that, um, <laughs> it's that some of the, the, the films, and particularly their subreddit, and their kind of, like, um, activism is not really, it's, it's not really, how do I say this? It's sort of propaganda-esque. That's all utopian societies. You too can drink the Kool-Aid of Utopia if you will just do as we say. <laughs> yeah, it, it's sort of like that, but not entirely. It's, it's not entirely obvious, but I, I, I don't know. Now, now um, I initially started to call myself... Um, what, what, what is their subreddit? It's... Because our guys doesn't have anyone there. It's, I, they have one, but... Uh, oh, TZM. Uh, oh. Okay. I mean, like, like like all utopian ideals, it's just a, it's an interesting idea, but it, it fundamentally it requires the world to not be the world. I'm like, okay, sure. <laughs> now I, I I call myself a Marxist, but. <laughs> oh, okay. You and we need to get you and Bit together. <laughs> so, yeah, I can see it now. Marxist versus Bit. <laughs> yeah, that'll go over smooth. <laughs> Uh. So why do you call yourself a Marxist? Um, most, mostly because I, I just think that it, it unlike pr probably the Zeitgeist moment, uh, movement, which is unlikely, it's, it's transitional. So if, if something didn't go wrong in the transitional phase, then it could potentially actually happen. So that's so you're saying that what transitional into Marxism or transitional into zeitgeist? No, transitional into Marxism. So a society could potentially transition into Marxism if uh, if nothing interrupted the process, like. Um, like when the when the Soviet Union went into communism, it wasn't uh, to transition into Marxism. It was to uh, for the benefit of the Bolshevik Party. That's an example of how the transitional phase went wrong. Well, how how do you prevent that though? Well, that that's something that would need to be uh, <laughs> that's something that would need to be watched for. I mean, if um, in the 1900s, early 1900s, late 1800s, they didn't have as much press and media, so it was easy to, you know, make propaganda. But I think it would be easier in a society where everyone... Have you read the blogosphere? Propaganda becomes increasingly easier. At the end of the day, the only weapon against propaganda is people thinking for themselves. Right. So that that's that. I mean, even if it's not a Marxist society, there's going to be propaganda. Well, I mean, it fails from very much the same problem that zeitgeistism does. And it expects humans to not be humans. When not in a small society, Marxism humans will not work uh, if they don't. Yeah, uh, basically, the human drive needs to be. Uh, yeah. A different human, basically, 
it, it, I mean, if if you look at if you if you look at you know Marxism and, and communism and all that, like it sounds like a utopian world until you realize the fundamental quintessential of it is human beings are not human beings. As long as human beings aren't human beings, it all works out splendidly. But right. the moment human beings become human beings... Well, it's not exactly that. It's <laughs> Communism does work in small societies. The thing is, when everyone knows everyone else, we all have empathy for each other, and we'll all work, because we want to think about, oh, I'm helping John over there. So communism does work in very small societies, and it is around the world, and it works there. When you get to anything smaller than a trivially small society, people won't think about that and they'll they'll they won't work as hard as they could and they won't produce as much that that's just what happens well um i mean that that's that's where um that's where certain things become uh different from when what they were in uh, back when we didn't have uh technology i mean if if we could apply technology in the fields where um in the fields where manual labor is present, then that would ultimately replace the lower middle class and the people doing work for their passion would do it for that rather than a monetary benefit. And it's been shown through a study, okay, it's been shown through a study at MIT that um, people who do things for a passion say, I'm a computer scientist, and I'm overpaid, or I'm, uh, or I'm at regular pay. Pay actually reduces the quality of my work by a large margin. Right, and this is something that Zeitgeist Movement works on too. In that, the only reason that you need to pay a human is to do manual labor jobs. As far as intelligent, creative, uh, rewarding jobs and other means, humans will do it. It's all, as long as they can live comfortably, humans will do it anyway. Uh, humans aren't lazy, but they don't want to do jobs that are manual labor. Yeah, exactly. If you apply, if you apply that to a communism society, uh, what's to keep it from moving into the zeitgeist society? Since you're already pretty close, where nobody does those kind of jobs, and you don't really need money since you're provided for, what what's the difference? Once you get to that point, I, I think that if if it came to that point, then it it would transition into that. But I don't think it would be the exact same thing because well, and then you come down to the chicken and egg thing of that. I mean, there's a reason Mike Rowe has a very it kind of took off doing dirty jobs because at the end of the day. Even if you turn a dirty job over to a machine, somebody's eventually got to clean out the machine. Or you need the machine to clean out the machine, and then the machine that cleans out the machine that cleans out the machine. E eventually, um, un unless you, you know, genetically engineer microbes that eat the gunk that clog up the machine, that's not, and then even then somebody's got to do that. <laughs> that's. <laughs> I I don't believe that that's. I don't see why a machine of the same size can't clean another machine of the same size. It's not like the utensil that they use has to be bigger than the machine itself. And it's not like the machine that uh, cleans the other machine produces weight. Uh, have either one of you maintained mechanical equipment? <laughs> no, I have. I know that they produce weight, but my, my point wasn't that. Mainly for things they produce a lot of grease and stuff like that. But not all of them produce much more than that. It's a lot. I, of I I I was referring to the fact that it, it's it's uh, how do you have a machine with moving parts, but the moving parts don't eventually wear out? Well, uh, well, that's that's where uh, uh, or, or or need routine maintenance or resun or uh, I mean I mean. It, well, they would they would need routine maintenance. I don't see why they wouldn't. But as far as a lot of cleaning, oil changes, that could be automated. Uh, really, you do get into a few things until we have true AI that can't be done. And that would have to be done by humans. But that's 
it wouldn't have to be the very trivial things. It wouldn't have to be the oil changes. It would more have to be changes with software, changes with inner circuitry, maybe something got in there that a machine can't be trusted to do because it, it might, it doesn't understand the circuitry, um, you know, until we get... Yeah, the, the manual labor. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's not going to be, you know, when you're cleaning a machine, it's not really a technical job usually. You're just cleaning out a bunch of gunk and changing the oil. Yeah, the you're oil. just basically doing a manual, blue-collar, menial job. It, it, you know, I, I just at the end of the day, I, I always I, I come back to thinking about the Jacksons. Oh, he made me push the button, and I had to push the button, and but I had to push the button. It's like if we get if we ever get our society to that point, the same way people bitch about having to pick up boxes or dig a ditch, or uh, they're gonna bitch about I had to push the button. He made me push the button. <laughs> it, it depends if it's uh, intellectually rewarding, like if they if they actually feel like they're doing anything meaningful with it. Any, but I'm, I'm saying as far as I don't think people would mind as much fixing a circuit as they would mind cleaning out gunk from a machine and that could be automated. The cleaning out gunk, there's no reason that a human has to do that versus another machine uh, who has some kind of little brush hole and it could clean out the gunk and then I don't see why a machine of the same kind can't do that and you know really it's just problems when the circuits wear out that a human might have to go in and that's okay because that's not I don't think that's as dirty of a job so it's not as it doesn't feel as bad yes it's manual labor but I don't think it's as bad as cleaning out the gun okay I have some uh, uh, with this start, start subject subject um, reading printing you could uh, potentially print its own parts yeah, we have the rapid prototypers. That was my favorite device at CES. It, it's literally uh, our our three D printing technology has literally gotten to the point that you can like print a coffee cup. I don't mean print on a coffee cup. I mean print a coffee cup. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it, it it'll be interesting to see how well. I mean, it's basically a replicator. It, it, it's primitive at this point, but. It, 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 theoretically, with the proper assembly line, yeah, you could print a bulldozer. Um, that's actually interesting because that's also a strong. Uh, you, that's also a strong part of uh, a zeitgeist society using those printers to print parts. Anyway, continue. Yeah, but I mean, somebody. My, here's my concern. Ultimately, with that type of society, nothing lasts forever. And I, 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 I'm a big fan of, of uh, Scott Card, so it, it, it's, it's like maybe he's screwed me up, I don't know. But um, it, it, basically I'm like, okay, so humans will move into the society, we'll push the button to start it, we'll issue in a utopia, everything will go on, and it, this is stuff that will last for 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years before it wears out. So there's no need for generations of human beings to have any clue how any of this shit works because it all just takes care of itself and we just focus on being human beings and enjoying being human beings. Well, eventually it's time to maintain this shit. Eventually it's time to, to repair the machine that builds the machine to, to get the, the nano printer, the 3D printers rebuilt. Uh, you know, it, it, and uh, talk about a societal collapse... <laughs> it's not like humans will stop being educated. Yeah. Uh, Y'all have a lot more faith in people than I do. It's, I'm sorry. At the end of the day, people go learn how to do something because they want it done. If it's... I, 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 I mean, what... what what percentage of humanity honestly has that curiosity spark of, ooh, I want to take the light bulb apart and understand the, the parts inside of it and why it does what it does? Uh, most... You only need, you only really need a people and to eventually, you know, it's not like the breakdown would happen instantly. So you only need a few people that would want to be interested in that stuff and who know that stuff. Uh, and they can teach others and by the time, you know, this happened, we can fix that stuff. You're assuming there'd be any of them left by that time, you know, 
Darwinism, I, survival of the fittest, they're no longer the most fit for society. I'm not sure when any of them would be left. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that there would always be some left. Would there be enough in the right places? Well, what do you mean the right places? I'm, there's, there's going to be, uh, you know, uni universal, well, you know what I mean by that, I mean Earth communication so even if they're in one city they could talk to everyone else in the world hey this is how this works unless the machine that governed that broke down <laughs> that blood that governed the communications I did well we do have multiple we would have multiple satellites as we do now and I think it's unlikely that they would all break down at the same time yeah that is uh, silly <laughs> unlikely not impossible but okay <laughs> You're right. Oh, if if okay, look, if every single factory that knew how to that built computers and every single computer engineer that knows how logic gates work died, not to mention every single book that describes that burn, we would have a problem on our hands right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're not that far from that now. <laughs> I, 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 I am sad to admit that uh, in the event of EMP, I am not prepared. <laughs> I have a book in my room that describes how a processor works, and I'm pretty sure it's safe from an EMP. It's safe from EMP, but like I said, you have that book, okay? You're thousands of miles away from me. The EMP goes off. I lose the internet. I don't have a way to get a hold. I don't actually even know where you actually are you know I'm just saying you know it's like I could write you a letter okay please make handwritten copies of that book I need them it's like <laughs> are you near a library actually increasingly no they're shutting down our libraries here yeah that sucks <laughs> I don't believe you I, I don't think that, that could really happen I think that if you actually got a bunch of statisticians to compute the probability of that happening, I think that it would be one of those things that would happen past the end of the universe. Like it is. <laughs> or, and have them be at a rolling model where we're continuing to digitize our books and we're continuing to have less and less physical copies. Not and mention, not all electronics get killed by EMPs. Name Depends. me an electronic that doesn't. Of course, if they're turned off. <laughs> well, here's here's a fun uh, fact. So, of the of the computers that so, what gets affected by EMPs is, is transistors. Right. And uh, for the few computers that use tubes, they actually don't die from EMPs. That's something I learned that was pretty cool. Wow. Yeah, you need pre-chip. Yeah, that stuff. Uh, old enough technology actually works rather well. Post EMP. Yeah, that, that, that I thought was I, I didn't know that I but I learned that. Uh, those old computers, they don't die. Basically what it'll fry is the transistors right. and um, it, it, it will, basically most things with an integrated circuit probably won't work. Right. And, you know, and we do have, you know, someone is going to have, I'm sure that there's a computer in the president's bunker and that's not going to be affected by an EMP even if it's a huge sunspot. You know, there's enough concrete there that I think it'll be fine. Mm. So consider that there's enough computers that are surrounded by enough... It wouldn't wipe us out, but in our modern society... Here's the thing. People think, oh, EMP, we get wiped out. We have an EMP, we break things. That's not what wipes us out. We're still fine. Like you're saying, there's the computer here, there's the copy there, there's the sun. It's the first it's the first three winters that would determine what happens to us. Right. Because, you know, first winter, uh yeah, we're going to most unfortunately most people would be doing whatever they need to to survive, which means Oh, yeah, well, I have this thing over here. Not too valuable right now, so, it, okay. How much stuff would survive the first winter? Then we got to do it again. Then we got to do it again. 
And, and whatever survives those first three winners, probably we've got it down. But I, it's like I, I think it would survive the EMP. I don't think it would survive the winners. Different things would become I priority. I think that even if all the I think that it would be. First of all, I think that we get it back on pretty quick. And second of all, um, you know, we've we've existed without it before. It's not like the governments don't know how to run a country. Oh no, we basically go back to like 1700s, 1800s. We wouldn't like be reset to the dark ages. We just go back about 100 to 200 years. That's about all. And, and you know, it, the government would have would handle things and they would get the things back up and they would stop riots and there were are, are we talking about the same government? <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, I no, I'm saying you just have faith in our government to just uh, okay. <laughs> government to control the citizens is in the interest of any government. Uh, that's a scary concept in and of itself. <laughs> it is. How they split it is you know, if, but about total collapse, it is it's in no government's interest for that to happen. How they make it not happen could be very scary. Yeah, I, I'm going to say, you're talking about martial law. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying that, you know, I don't know if total collapse could happen because of that. Anyway, you know, have you heard about how they're... Um, so, uh, you know, there's, the world's not ending in 2012, but scientists looking at the sun said there actually is a, the biggest sunspot that we've seen in a long time coming around that time that might knock out a significant amount of... Wait, wait, I thought we were entering a solar minimum. Huh? I thought we were, a lot of them were saying we were fixing to enter a solar minimum. Well, let me look at it. This is, you see, this is this great thing about scientists. Eggs are kill you. Oh, you need eggs. We're entering a solar minimum. Oh, biggest sunspot ever. Oh, CO2 gases are going to kill us all. Uh, maybe we're not quite sure. <laughs> I love scientists. <laughs> so, uh, so are we heading for the mother of all sunspots or entering a solar minimum, James? <laughs> I'm pretty sure we're to have the mother of all sunspots. Because uh, I, I thought that was like when the sun did its 22-year reset a few years ago. It might be in... 2013, because the sun's on a on a basically every 11 years. This because the sun goes through a 22 year cycle, but every 11 years of that cycle, it gets to the point where it just kind of snaps. Yeah, it, that that that's what I'm saying. And so they're so uh, they're saying it looks from what I'm reading about 2012 or 2013. Uh, there's going to be the the biggest sunspot. Okay, so we're having that 11-year snap. Like, for those of you who don't know, our, our sun's weird. Uh, the outside of it and the inside of it, because of its size, spin at different rates. And every... Uh, it takes 22, roughly 22 years for it to complete a cycle of this. But every 11 years, the tension gets enough that basically... It's like, okay, I've got about as much torque as I can take. And it just violently snaps back and throws these... Uh, more violent than usual solar flares off as the surface and things snap back together. Oh, question. Question. Sure. Is the show actually going on? <laughs> it, say that again? Is the show actually going on yet? <laughs> uh, uh, yes. We just kind of cut in when we start talking. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> So, yes. feel, feel free to throw in anything. It's like we just kind of go where the conversation goes. We, 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 we put notes up, but we don't half the time we don't even pay attention to them. And sometimes we do. <laughs> it's like... All right. 